So really, the, well, I'll walk through it a little bit. Is about and this is this is this is an old presentation. I call it Harold's presentation because it's so old, uh, but I like it. Um, so this, is, well, I'll, I'll kind of cover generally speaking the effects of non-condensables, what it means to your refrigeration system. You know, how do you measure non-condensables? Which you know, years ago, you know, I was in technical services, and, and it's important to understand how to do that. Um, then, then probably we'll get into the real meat of it. It's really around the operation of a purger and then some of the preventive maintenance schedules that we do offer around the purgers themselves. Um, so it's it's the why. Why 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 do I why do I need a purger? Why do I care? Because uh, of non-condensable. Non-condensables are not inherent to the refrigeration system, right? They're they're um, they're ingre they ingress into the system usually usually when you perform service or if you're operating in a vacuum you have that potential to constantly drawing air into your system um, and what does it do is it, it increases the electrical power and I'll show a slide on that why uh, it reduces capacity it becomes air it acts as an insulator in some cases um, and just like your window panes in your house right uh, and uh, because of the higher pressures that your system's operating at it can increase uh, maintenance cost. So, uh, simply put, right? So, uh, everyone knows a, everyone's got a PT chart with them somewhere on their person at all times, right? Ooh, okay. Hang on, hold on. <laughs> so, so the pressure temperature correlation, uh, you know, it's not subcooled, it's not super This is normal pressure temperature correlation. Uh, what air does once it gets in your system is it's actually added to that pressure temperature. So. If you're measuring uh, pressure and temperature at the outlet of a condenser uh, under normal conditions, it's going to the pressure temperature chart correlation will be there. If you have air, the pressure will actually be higher than the temperature would indicate. And that's how you know. That's how you know uh, when you have air in the system is when that correlation uh, departs. So, when do you have air in your system? When you don't. When you don't throw. When you're not purging, your purge is not working. That's definitely one, right? Well, yeah, you don't. Some, you're, you're, you're you're pressure, yeah. Some people they think it's strictly tied to pressure. Hey, when my pressure is higher, I've got air. Well, what happens in the winter? Your pressure is going down. Do you have air in your system in the winter? Yeah. Right, you're not getting out. If you're not, so what will happen is, uh, if, you know, if most people, I, this is kind of silly now, but most people have purges. You know, one time they did manual purging or they had a manual purger. Uh, but the problem is here is, you know, head pressure will build up to a point that's noticed by the operator, and he goes, oh wow, that's really high, or he has a high pressure cutout trip out, and he says, oh, I think I better go fix that comes down and you got other things to do and the pressure starts building up again and comes down it builds up again and this is not only true if you have a purger or you do a manual purge, but it's also true if you're not maintaining your purge because what will happen is purge may not be working no one notices it and then you know high warmer weather comes around or something that happens and he goes oh well wait a minute but this whole shade this whole shaded area here is uh, energy penalty which you're paying by not maintaining the purge. And you might not feel it because, oh, it's cold outside, but but you're paying that price every day because of this excess pressure due to uh, the non-condensables. Well, and again, this all depends on you. Did, 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 who has a, you know what your kilowatt, kilowatt rate per hour is? Nobody? No idea. Okay, so above my pay grade. Was it? Above your pay grade, right? <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think these numbers are, are from over the years. They've kind of been realistic. They, you know, you can negotiate contracts with the energy companies, but but I think these, for for fairness sake, are, are reasonably, you know, you might get a super deal, and it might be less than this, and you've seen it higher. So, so five pounds, 15 pounds, what's, what's, when do you need to purge? <coughs> what point, what point does it make sense to purge? It's exactly right. Yeah, it's exactly right. You don't need to wait. Don't wait, please. Because even at these very modest, you know, oh, a five pound, it doesn't sound like a lot. It can add up a lot. And what if you had an extra ten thousand dollars in your pocket? Would you would you want that or not? I mean I would. Oftentimes it's not five pounds, it's fifteen pounds. It's fifteen pounds, so it's a lot more than just a little bit. So 
Now this is this is based on uh, 20 degrees saturated suction. Uh, who's, who's, what's your low suction on here in this group? Is anyone here minus 20? Minus negative 10. Negative 10. Negative 10. Oh, you're on five oh, fifty. So. Minus what? Minus fifty. Five zero. Minus five zero. Wow. Okay. Okay. So what do you, what do you think is going to happen to these numbers when I flip this to this slope? Yeah. So those same those same numbers at fifteen pounds up to forty five thousand dollars a year, and this is a very very conservative model, right? So that's what it means. That's what it means when your purger's not working and you're operating at these higher pressures. It, it does end up being big money. So really, it, it's it, it, this is only to illustrate. It's not enough to just simply have a purger. It's, it's, it's important that you maintain it. And that's because everything's working so much harder. Yeah. Well, it, it's no. Yeah, because the pressure has to work against a higher head pressure. So there's more energy required to overcome that pressure. Okay. That's why, yeah. Okay. This is just also, here's not a great thing because it's like the windows of your house, right? There's that gap in between the windows. The two panes of glass, that's the air, the exit is an insulator, the exit is an insulator. Yeah, even, even, even not just the compressor, the refrigerator is affected too. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, really, you know, the good news is it's not hard to figure out, right? Do I have nine connections? Um, there's that pressure temperature. Let me put this part of the pressure. No, no, I guess it's not. I guess it's not. Oh, maybe it was here. It's gone. All right. Um, so, <coughs> all right. So maybe I can talk you through this. It's, it's easier with the illustration. So, um, so at 89 degrees Fahrenheit at the outlet of the condenser, you expect to see 163 pounds. That's what you'd expect to see. Um, if you have five pounds or ten pounds of nine condensable, so right there. So it would be the equivalent of ninety-two degrees Fahrenheit. But but the penalty you're paying is the pressure. So um, all, all you have to do really to figure it out is simply look at that outlet of the condenser. See if the pressure and the temperature correlate. That's ambient temperature. Well, I'm against the pipe, right? You're trying to sense the temperature of the refrigerant. I mean, in a, in a perfect world, not a perfect world, in a, um, a different world, you would say, hey, I'm going to take a temperature sensor, wrap it with insulation of some pipe just so I can get a good reading that is affected by the air around it. Um, and then you'd have a pressure drain solution. Ideally, again, this is ideal, this is not what's required. But you, you can do the same thing with it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think for, for, for the, 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 the purpose part. for the purpose of what you're trying to understand, yes. You know, because if it's within a degree or two, you're, you're fine. You, know, you say, hey, listen, I got it or don't. No. And usually when we get the call, the call usually comes in <laughs> about, hey, my purger stopped working. Believe it or not, it's the call you get. And uh, it's like, hey, my purger stopped working. What's wrong? You know, it's been purging like crazy for weeks, and now it stopped. Right. Well, and that's the answer. The first question. I learned this the hard way, right? The first question is, what's your non-condensable? Or no, for, I used to ask when I was a, a pup, I'd say, hey, is, uh, do you have non-condensables? Oh, yeah, we got lots of them. Hey, we're on our back and we got lots of them. Oh, okay, well, let's try to figure out what's wrong with the project. I learned not to ask that question. I learned to ask, hey, what's your, <coughs> what's your condensing temperature right now? Oh, well, it's this. Oh, okay, what's your temperature, by the way? I'm just kind of here. Oh, okay, now... Now you see that 15 pound differential, now you're right, there's something going on. Or half the times, it would be they're, 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 you know, within a couple pounds of each other, which is, to your point, could just be the, the difference in the, the measurement, right? So uh, sometimes a purchase doesn't release non condensed because it's done its job, right? Other times it's because it's not functioning and you don't notice it until head pressures get high. You notice it when it's high, you don't notice it in the middle of winter, you notice it when it's high. But the way to be sure is to monitor it, right? Either you do it off the PLC, you make it part of your routine, hey, just some validation. You can do it, um, and I'll show you another way. That looks like a simple, simple little uh, unit there. Ours is definitely more complicated. Yeah, this is, yeah, no, like, I, I'm trying not to turn any of it. Really, if I sound like a salesman, I don't need to. Uh, I'm trying not to sell anything to you guys. I'm just trying to help you guys walk you through some things, hopefully, how uh, you can take home. Uh, yeah, this is just a simple, this is a simple pressure temperature transducer. I mean, this is a pressure transducer, temperature transducer. It goes in this little box. The nice thing about this little box is it does a conversion for you, right? It will tell you you've got five pounds of excess pressure, you've got 15 pounds of excess pressure. 
So it kind of goes through that for you. Uh, and you can set a threshold. You know, if you think five pounds is a reasonable threshold, you can do that. If you think two pounds, you can have this thing set off an alarm to say, go figure out what's going on. If you're not doing it already, do it on means. That's really what this does. The best way, the be yeah, there's different ways, right? So one of the, and I, I guess we can talk to it at any time. Um, the, the, what I just showed you is the purest way to measure it, right? When you have not condensed, the purest way to measure it is add the outlet of the condenser and it's the purest. Uh, one of the things that we do with uh, our more advanced purgers is we, we have this technology where we look for non condensables at different purge points. And, and, the, and that AP, the, what we call the APP, it's a water purger, that has this auto sequence sensing technology that goes, hey listen, uh, on the old style purgers, which I'll show you in a minute, it's a timer, right? There's a, a, a timer that you set for each purge point. Now I, I want to purge this one for just, you know, 10 minutes, this one for 15, you, know, you, you set it up manually. What you're describing is this auto seek technology. What it'll do is it'll go to purge point one, and if it doesn't, if it releases any non condensables during that cycle, it'll spend another 10 minutes on it. And if it sees another cycle where it had non condensable release, it spends another 10 minutes. And then it moves on to the next purge point. The next purge point may not have any non condensables, so it'll do 10 minutes. If it doesn't see non condensables, it automatically moves to the next point. So it's constantly adjusting where it's spending its time. Look, as your system's running, mm -hmm. Your non-condensables are going to get to every purge point. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, not I mean, equally, you, but not equally. Right. But, right. But if you, if you, let's say you run one manual purge point to your auto purger, mm -hmm. it might not function as well as if it changed points. But you're still going to be trapping those non-condensables. Uh, what? I don't know if I have a slide on this stuff. Oh, this, this is probably close to what you're talking about. I don't know if it, uh, the details aren't there. So, um, I'm talking about condensers. Yeah, but so, so the, yeah, and here's what, here's what can happen though. Here's what can happen is right now, we, 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 this is a manifold, right? This yep. is taking multi, multi, multiple point purging into one header back to the purge. Yep. The, the concern becomes not that eventually that condenser will make it here. Is that if all these were open and no solenoid valves were just open, you can actually have non condensables migrate to the slightly low pressure uh, condensers. Right, but you're not you're not opening them all. You're opening one. Oh, if you open one, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I, I thought you were saying, hey, I didn't have solenoid valves and had them all tied open. You're right. Yeah, but then someone has to come around and say, hey, uh, this is a first point. I'm going to open this one, and you think non condensables out, and you stay there, right? And then this other condenser may have non condensables in it. You go to the next one. Then, then someone's, are you saying mainly adjust? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can do that. Yeah, yeah you can do it's that. Fine. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then who does it? Well, when it's winter. Well, no one wants to go up the rough anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, this is change for A little bit. Yeah, a lot of things you don't want to do. Yeah, a lot of things you don't want to do. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Uh, so, this is a typical arrangement for a merger. Uh, you know, when we say purge points, these are actual points on the system that we're collecting non-condensers from right. and bringing it back to one purger. And then the purger typically is a uh, device cycling these remote purge points. And there's only one active at a time for what we were, I was trying to describe. Okay, so meet and data time is, uh, is coming. So here's the cutaway of a purger. This is the AP purger. It's a, it's a little bit different than the APP. Is an additional collection chamber for the water, but but the primary function of the purger, which is to remove non condensables from the system, the approach is is very very similar on the air side. Everybody's awake still. Yeah. <laughs> this one will lose weight on. Oh God! Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So uh, first point. Okay. So here we go. So. The, there's um, a fill and pull down stage on the AP purgers, similar to what the APP has. So what we're doing in this stage is we're taking the high pressure liquid, bringing it into the purger, and, it, and it, there's 
there's a high side of the furniture and a low side of the furniture, uh, indicated by the color. So here, uh, everything in, in orange right now is a high side, high pressure side. Everything in blue is a low pressure side. So what we're doing in this fill and cool down, we're bringing liquid into both the high and the low side. We're trying to fill these chambers up with liquid. Uh, at the same time, we're cooling the purger down. I mean, it's open to suction, right? So I'll, I'll do this slower. I, sometimes I move this cursor a little too fast. Okay, so let's just follow the line. So liquid comes in, trainer there. This this is an energized solenoid valve. You know, Phil talked about the pilot lights earlier. If you don't have them on your purger already, do it. Just add the pilot lights to the per, on the solenoid. Because what you see, what I described here, solenoid one, solenoid two. They have a perch point pilot light on there, a little uh, beacon pilot light. It makes it really easy to troubleshoot the purger because you can see what's going on. Uh, and the pilot lights simply, don't simply tell you you have power to that coil, it tells you that the coil is actually energized and creating a magnetic field. So you know that that magnet's pulling in that plunger that Phil talked about earlier. So uh, in this stage, you're gonna see this number one solenoid valve energized, which is allowing liquid to go into <coughs> Um, the high side, so it's filling up this chamber, which is an air collection chamber, and it's also flowing through um, this liquid level control and flowing to the low side. So it's filling up this chamber to this liquid level sensor point here. Once liquid is wet, I'm going to say liquid's wet all the time. Okay. Um, <laughs> once the sensor's wet, then it absorbs the heat of the heater. So a lot of guys don't understand what this valve is doing. It's really there's a heater in here, and then it's a thermal uh, bulb. And so um, the heat uh, expands the refrigerant that's in the charge, which drives the valve open. So when there's no, so the heat's there, it warms up the bulb, the bulb pushes this um, thermostatic element on top, which drives this valve open. So right now, when you start up a purger, this thing's completely dry, right? It's right. warm. This valve is in the open position at that point. So liquid's coming through this liquid level control, filling the chamber. Once it reaches this heater element, it absorbs the heat, it cools the bulb, and then this goes to a closed position. Going around. And then, yeah, so, so this is, that's to fill the low side of the chamber. On the high side of the chamber, what's going on is we're waiting for this float switch to make and then we de-energize this number two solenoid valve. This, the only time you're gonna see this number two solenoid valve open is during this cool cooldown stage, yeah. And that's just to provide a vent to allow liquid to fill to the float switch. So if you buy a repair kit for an annual overhaul, will the kit automatically have the idiot light in it? No, because hopefully the guy had the idiot light already. I mean, we could we could do that. You're right. I mean, I just you know didn't know if you had to make sure. Yeah, I think I think I would. I never thought about it that way. I, I think you could, you could, you could. We, we could, you know, we we sell um, a rebuild kit, which is is a re, uh, which basically goes through everything that we know from right. our history. And we, and we buy one and we do yeah. it annual. Yeah. And that's why I say if yeah. it's already in the kit, then you're going to put it in there. Yeah, the pilot, the pilot lights, the fortunately, fortunately, those pilot lights last. You know, they're LED lights. They're uh, no moving parts in there. It's an inductive coil. You replace the solenoid coil and keep that pilot light, hopefully for the life of the purger. Uh, I like, I like your thinking because no, we haven't thought that way, but um, I think it's a good idea. So again, here's your key: energized solenoid coils, liquid line. In this stage, right, fill and cool. There's a pipe. There's a light on the front of the panel tells you in the cool down mode, and then the vent line again, only energized until this float switch is made. So you know that light should go off. You may not be fully cooled down yet. That light can go off before you're fully cooled down because that float switch hasn't risen until the point that he turns this off. Okay, everybody good on this cool down stage? Some guys leave the purges run continuously until they do a maintenance on it, and that's the only time we'll see this stage. Most of the time, purge is going to be in this uh, separate non condensable stage where it's really doing, starting, it's starting to collect uh, foul gas. So in this case, I'm going to stay with the theme. So stay with the high pressure liquid line. This solenoid is on. This valve is either open or closed based on the liquid level in the chamber. 
What hit him here? Why, why is this doing what it's doing? It's check valve. Yeah. It's 30 pounds though. Shouldn't it be open? You got high pressure liquid here. Why is it showing close? Differential. It's a differential pressure, right? So right now, this is high pressure. This is the high side of the verger. So it's, it's close to the condensing pressure. And this is what's liquid, high pressure liquid, close to condensing pressure. So the 30 pound, this is a, this is a often misunderstood valve as well. The only time this 30 pound check valve is in play, should be in play, is in the cool down mode that we saw earlier when it's filling. And there's a, there's a trick answer we'll show you later, is uh, during a loss of foul gas pressure, provides a means of Stop. stabilizing that pressure, hopefully uh, hopefully keeping the liquid level uh, maintained until you recover from your loss of pressure. So again, liquid in stops here because you got 30 pounds and you're equalized, more or less equalized inlet to outlet. And so the, di the differential is less than 30 pounds, so that's why this valve is closed, or shown closed. Uh, the suction was always wide open, right? Always going. Then uh, what's new now in this stage is the foul gas line. <clears throat> and foul gas is the, our term for a mixture of refrigerant gas and non-condensables, called foul gas. But as you migrate from these various first points throughout the system, what, what can happen along the way? Some of, that, they, uh, some of that refrigerant gas can condense along the way. And do you need to take non-condensables out of liquid refrigerant? Why? It's already condensed. It's already condensed, yeah, exactly. It's by, by definition, right? It's already condensed. So uh, instead of tying up purging capacity with that, what we do is we have this uh, stainless steel float ball drainer here. So any any condensate that collects along the way is... Collect with your cup. Yeah, I guess where it goes. Most useful right. place on the purger is on the low side of the purger, so it provides liquid makeup. When you do have uh, non-condensable, I mean, when you have condensed refrigerant, it goes right to work, right to work. Okay. So then we're now, that's, we understand that now. So we'll, this is the foul gas solenoid valve and it allows this high pressure gas that has non-condensables in it to go through this flooded bath of cold liquid ammonia. The colder the better. So, so the, the, and I think there's a chart on this too, but, um, you want this ideally connected to the lowest available suction pressure you have at your plant. Because um, you, know, you talk about the correlation between pressure and temperature. Now think of it in the reverse direction. The, the, the colder I can make the refrigerant gas, the more refrigerant I'm gonna condense out of that gas. That's the more effective separation. You can separate at all different degrees of temperature. The most effective is the coldest because that means that you've, you've condensed the most possible refrigerant gas out of that and all that should remain at that point is not condensables. So, blood and bath, now we're condensing. Now, so now, from what was all gas, now becomes a combination of liquid refrigerant and non-condensables. So now it collects in this chamber where you'll see, you'll recognize a float switch. If you've walked up to the purger anytime, you'll see this float switch. That's the air collection chamber where as the non-condensables begin to collect, what happens to this liquid level? It, it depresses, right? The non-condensables depress the liquid level down. Now, if that was the end of the line, what would happen? It, we would collect and it would stop because it's not a continuous process, right? It has to be continuous flow. If you go to a dead stop, there's nowhere for the non-condensables to go. So you have to constantly be drawn in new non-condensables. So there's a, you know, the theory about the, you know, the bucket of water you have to drill a hole in the water at the bottom, right? So you can continue to pour more water in. So we're pouring more water in. The way we do that, really, oops, sorry. The way we're doing that is we have this metering valve, the solenoid valve, and after the metering valve, you'll never see this anywhere else, by the way. Or, well, I, I can tell you one other place, but you'll never see this anywhere else. You have a solenoid valve, then you have a strainer. You guys, you guys work on a burger, you don't know why. You don't know why. Because immediately after, is a metering valve, a very small stainless steel metering valve. And it's a tapered seat, and tapered seats are infamous for great dirt collectors. Yeah, great dirt collectors. So what we've done is we said, hey, we're gonna put a strainer in here, but this is a, 
this is not your standard 60 mesh trainer. It's a, uh, a mesh, it's a, it's, a, uh, I don't, it's a 100 mesh with the stainless steel wool stuffed inside. So if you, when you first see it, you think, oh my God, this thing's full of crap, right? It's not, it's actually a stainless steel wool, so kind of leave it in there, guys. Because uh, it's there for a reason, it's to provide that extra filtration ahead of the meter. Okay, so now we're drawing liquid, and guess where we're putting that liquid? Right back to the low side. So this, under normal circumstances, the liquid that's been condensed off the final gas actually becomes the primary liquid makeup to the purger. Really, in operations, that's, you, that's what you would expect. And then this liquid level is just under, hey, if you've got really high condensables, that's when this thing starts to do more work. So fully your gas out. Mm -hmm. Here? No, no, no. Here, here. Oh, here. Okay. You go up to where that orifice is, that number five solenoid. Yeah. And then you've got the meter valve and then the orifice. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I actually got sent the wrong orifice in my last rebuild kit. Oh. I have like, what in the hell it was is going on? This oh, rushing yeah. through? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off of the top, off of the top. So, well, yeah, well, I'll talk, I'll, talk, I'll talk about that. Not that, but I'll talk about that uh, arrangement here in a second. So, um, so here we're collecting the nine condensables, but the level's not low enough yet to activate the switch. Uh, so that's why you don't see this energizing, we're not, there's no flow here. Because we haven't collected enough nine condensables to do a, a release, a purge release. Here that's only two is closed. Uh, what's, what's going on here, guys? What's this check valve about? Yeah, it's an internal relief valve, high to low relief. It's not a ASME vessel. This is not an ASME uh, vessel, therefore it's not code required to have an atmospheric relief. You can choose to do that, not a problem, but it's not required. So we have a high to low. So if the pressure gets too high, it'll vent to suction. Um, and we'll, that'll become important later if we talk about troubleshooting. But I just wanted to point it out now since we're following the flow of the gas. <clears throat> okay. Here, let me know when you're at a good stopping point. We can. Uh, I'll tell you what. I, I think what I'd like to do is get through this slide because this kind of walks you all the way through the purger operation, and then we'll take a breather, and then I'll go into deeper troubleshooting. Right? Okay. So um, now we've had a chance to collect enough nine condensables that the level's been depressed, and at that point, then we see a couple of new solenoid valves come into play. So the number five solenoid valve, which is the purge gas solenoid valve. Um, is energized, it goes through that orifice and check valve to what we famously call the bubbler. So this is now non-condensable air, basic air, mostly air, non-condensable <coughs> gas. And it goes through the bubbler, and why does it go through a bubbler bath full of water? Because they don't fill your room with ammonia. Could be, there could be some residual ammonia in the gas. <coughs> so it absorbs any residual and it provides a very effective means of an indicator of what's going on in your purger, right? And my, when I purge, I can see it. I walk by a bubbler, bubbling, you know what's going on, right? Um, and then the other thing that's going on now is a, this number six solenoid valve, which is our water flush, our water makeup. So as we're bubbling away, we're, we energize the solenoid valve to bring fresh water into the bubbler. And then the overflow goes down your sewer. Stones yeah, yeah, and, and we, yeah, we can talk through that too. I mean, there's, um, there, if you got really hard water, you're dealing with real hard water at your plant, or if you're not, the purge is not properly maintained, sometimes you get ammonia carbonate, and, and that'll look like mineral deposit. That's what it is. That yeah, could be. So, by the end of today, <laughs> by the end of today, if it's not working, you'll hopefully have a, an idea of how to address it, how to fix it, it or how to meet, more important, how to maintain it. So, uh, Jake, or Drake, sorry. Um, we can take, this is a good time, yeah. good stopping point. Yeah. And then uh, we'll come back and we'll do the rest yeah. of the work. Lunch is here, so. Okay. Load up. Oh, wow. yeah. okay.